Hello there, sword friends. I have another vlog log sword vlog to tell you about some sword news. Now, I hadn't intended on making one as quickly as I have, but I mean, frankly, I don't know why I even say that anymore. I will make one of these when I have something to say that is sword related that relates to me. So, here we go. First up, I got this Cold Steel Emperor Katana, and I have some stuff to chat about as it relates to Cold Steel, a couple lessons learned and some things to note. So, first off, I got the sword secondhand off of Facebook of all places. It was for sale on a group of buy and sell and trade sword related things. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's a great chance for me to pick up a cold steel sword. I got it for about $165 shipped, which is a pretty good deal for an Emperor series sword. And I thought that that would be a great price that I could actually afford to do a YouTube review on them. Now I've had a couple of requests to do reviews on a cold steel sword. I was hoping to get the warrior katana. I like the look of it a little bit more and it seems to be the most common sword out there from cold steel that gets purchased, be, probably because it's one of the, the less expensive, but frankly I think it's probably one of the, the cooler looking ones as well. On any note, I got the sword and I had specifically asked the buyer, does it have any scratches, nicks or dings or something to that effect? And while the buyer, or rather I'm the buyer, the seller did not specifically say no, which I realize in retrospect was probably something I should have asked more directly. They did lead me to believe by saying it's in good condition that uh, no was the answer to my aforementioned question. Unfortunately, that is not entirely the case. You can see here that uh, right in this area, let's see if I can get it up to the camera, there's a pretty good ding in the lacquer. Uh, there's some other pings and dings on the scabbard, which frankly aren't necessarily that big a deal. But when I took the blade out and started looking at it, I noticed that there is a reasonably sized ding in the edge. In post, I will try to show you a closer up image of said ding. The downside there is that my intention was to use the sword for a YouTube review. And well, frankly, if the edge is already dinged, well, it's not exactly in the area that you would use to do cutting. It's still a ding and it makes folks think or at least it makes me think, is this a secondhand sword? Was there an issue with a heat treatment? Uh, you know, what's going on? Why is the edge already dinged? Now, I intend to follow through with the review and do it anyway, but it is something that I will have to note and that brings into question whether uh, the review I'm gonna do is valid or not. In defense, I don't see the marks indicating that this is a scratch and dent model like I have seen on some other cold steel. Usually the back of the Hibaki is marked. I've seen one that had like a two stamped into it and I think that means that it was a not a second hand, but like a scratch and dent or factory second type model. I don't see that on this. I'm guessing it was on display. Maybe somebody whacked a staple or hit another sword's edge or something like that. And that damaged it. I don't know. The downside for me though, personally, is that I asked if the sword edge had any dings and I was led to believe that no was the answer to that question. So I was a bit disappointed when I contacted the seller to say, Hey, I noticed that there was a ding. They got rather disgruntled somewhat quickly and, uh, Within a couple of messages exchanged, I was banned from sending them any more Facebook messages. Now, that was a little bit irritating and uh, kind of a bummer for me, honestly. Now, I hadn't made any demands or said that I want to do this or that or the other. I just noted, hey, I got it and it's not in the condition that was described. And I was uh, not able to send any messages after that point. I tried posting it on Facebook as well, but the administrators of the, the group that I bought it from thought it was too drama inducing and didn't really have a place on, on that specific form location and to to maybe format it in a different way and post it in a different way or uh, bring the drama somewhere else. So I brought it here. And I know the, the point is that I got the sword for a really good deal, admittedly. 165 for an Emperor Steel, Emperor uh, Cold Steel Katana model is not a bad deal. Uh, but I'm also a little bummed out that it's not in the condition that was described. No, when I before the Facebook post got taken down, uh, while well, it was taken down by me by request of, of one of the admins there, uh, some folks did chime in and say, hey, uh, you should probably learn to sharpen the edge and take care of that kind of stuff yourself if you intend on playing with swords. I don't really know how to do that. I don't have a, I don't have the tools to do it in a way that really is, is useful or conducive to, to keeping a good edge on a sword. I should learn how to do it. I don't know how, I don't really have the tools to do so. And I don't really think that if you ask for a sword, if you ask, does it have this issue, and it in fact does when you get it, and you're led to believe no, that you should be expected to do extra work. Now, I've sold many a sword, and I have, uh, well, in, in a number of occasions, failed to accurately describe the sword. There might have been a wiggle or something that bothered somebody, 
Some of it was really uh, learning. When I started selling things, I didn't know how to describe it or what people would really look for. Uh, I was kind of moving through swords as I was collecting them and looking at them and learning what my preferences were. But over time, I've learned that, you know, anytime I forgot to mention something or I didn't notice something or I didn't know something was an issue, I was usually pretty inclined to say, hey, what can I do to make it better? And I didn't get that and I thought that that was kind of what made my blood boil a little bit. But I guess there's two sides to the story. One is I got a really good deal on it, so should I bitch at all? Or the other side is I asked if this was the issue. When I asked, I was kind of given a little bit of grief and then relatively promptly uh, prohibited from, from sending any more messages. So I'm not sure exactly where to go with it. I did buy over PayPal, so I guess I could uh, make a dispute there or do something about it, but I'm not exactly sure what the best course of action is. What do you think? Is it one of those things where I'm just being a dick and I should just shut up, I got the sword for a good deal and be happy with what I have? Or is it one of those things that on principle I specifically ask a question, led to believe one thing, and when I get the sword it's in a different condition than advertised? Is that is that something that I should I should raise up the flagpole or do or make an effort to do something about? That is what I have for you on the cold steel front. I'm actually going to add one more thing about cold steel and do this post-edit insert because I realized that I neglected to put in a relatively important note about cold steel products, and that is that there is some controversy, if you will, around the company's ethics. Right now, I'm not trying to tell you if it is or isn't ethical. Uh, just a purely unbiased, quick look at it. Cold Steel has patented the name or trademarked the name Sanmai and is uh, sending cease and desist letters to some smaller manufacturers for using that to describe some of their products. Now, from my limited understanding, the term Sanmai means basically you have a, a softer outer steel and a harder inner edge, but it's like a sandwich of steels and is a, a historical term used to describe a construction methodology. So for a cold steel to trademark it, it's kind of like trademarking the name forging or Damascus or pattern welded or like when Sony tried to, to uh, copyright Let's Play. It's a phrase that's commonly used uh, to describe a construction methodology and I, I'm no patent attorney or lawyer or I, I have no idea. I don't even honestly know uh, the full depth of what's going on in this particular instance, but I can say that if that bothers you, you can research it and look into what's going on. Uh, one part of the camp may certainly say it's perfectly acceptable in a capitalist society to protect uh, your intellectual property, it doesn't matter if it's capitalist or not, but you know, this, this is how business works and that's just how the ethics go. And the other side may say that while it might be legal, you're still a douche for doing it and, you know, don't copyright terms and send cease and desist letters to people for using a common term to describe the construction method for their product because it's the most accurate term to describe said construction method. Uh, and it's kind of morally abhorrent for a larger company to go after a little guy for trying to simply do business when you know they can't afford litigation of any kind uh, or even the time away from work to pursue it if it won't hold up in court or not. I don't know if it would or wouldn't, I'm not a lawyer. But those are two camps and maybe maybe knowing that information will steer you toward or away cold steel products, but there's that. Now, some companies are pretty good about keeping their personal proclivities outside of uh, news. Cold Steel does not seem to be one of those companies. Uh, their the CEO, I believe he's the owner, Lynn Thompson, and I'm, I haven't done a whole lot of research into this, so it's a bit hearsay, but it's also in a vlog. So, you know, take it for what it's worth and investigate any further. I don't mean to uh, steer you in a wild tangent or throw hearsay out, but from my understanding, Lynn Thompson is an avid hunter and has gone on uh, safaris or some such thing to hunt exotic animals. And some folks find that, again, somewhat distasteful. And some folks really enjoy doing it and can't wait to go on a safari. So, again, I'm not trying to tell you how to spend your money. If that doesn't bother you, or if you are a fan of exotic animal hunting, uh, or uh, safari hunting, or big game hunting in that respect, and, uh, you know, hunting leopards and such doesn't bother you, then maybe you uh, share a kindred spirit with uh, the owner and uh, that may steer you toward his products. Uh, by contrast, maybe that type of activity bothers you and you don't want to uh, 
don't want to elicit service or products from a company that uh, whose owner participates in that type of activity. Now, and I think a lot of cases with swords, I don't know a whole lot about manufacturers, owners, and what they do in their spare time, with, with pretty rare exception. There's only a few folks that seem to come out pretty commonly in the realm of like, we sue people to protect intellectual property, and some folks think that we're going, going about it a little overzealously. There's a couple of companies that I, I can think of, and it's Cold Steel and Angel Sword are the ones that come to mind in terms of uh, having, having some sort of reputation for that. Uh, in terms of like the company's owner uh, doing things that are, are, are you know, in, in the same type of vein, I don't really know. Like, I have no idea uh, who actually owns Hanway, if it's Paul Chan or not, and like what he does in his spare time. I don't know of any other sword manufacturer and like really what the hell else they do that would open up the opportunity for people to judge them. They sell products and keep their private lives, uh, at least from what I've seen, somewhat private. Now that may be completely untrue and I may not just be looking, uh, but it hasn't come up in my Facebook news feed, it hasn't come up in the areas that I look to read things about what the owners do in their spare time that would give me the opportunity to judge them. Uh, but it seems like this is one of those cases where as a consumer, if you want to spend your money with uh, companies that represent your particular ideals, then uh, Cold Steel has given you the opportunity to do that. That's about it. Again, I'm not trying to tell you how to spend your money one way or the other. Do whatever the hell you want with it. It's not my call, of course, but the more you know. Bum, 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 bum. I haven't gotten any other swords. Last week was a really busy week. I got a lot of different swords in the mail. I have a lot of different stuff to review. I have a lot of tests to do, I have a lot of swords to share, but that is really all that I have in terms of what I own. There is one additional though, uh, additional thing I should say, and that is that a friend of mine from my Toyama Ryu group was gracious enough to lend me a Tatsuki Nihonto sword to do a basic review on. I won't be able to do any cutting with it because it's not my sword and it's relatively expensive, but I will be able to at least showcase some of what the Tatsuki Nihonto folded series has to offer and you don't see a whole lot of information about them because they're really expensive. And I mean, when you spend 2000 something dollars on a sword, there's a lot of swords that you can get at that price point, and a lot of folks, for whatever reason, don't seem to get the Taisuki Nihonto one. So I have one of those to show you, and I'll probably be able to include some of the uh, the other legacy photos that I have from other Taisuki branded swords that I've owned. I know I at least have some photos of one of them, a really basic model one, but anyway. I'll have that, and I'm going to try and get that done actually this weekend so I can be a gracious uh, recipient of the, the borrowed sword and return it somewhat promptly. The last bit of news that I have is more in relation to the Toyama Ryu practice that I've been going through, and some of you have uh, shown support or interest in knowing a little bit more about that and and what that that leg of my journey is like. Uh, ultimately, uh, Toyama Ryu is a style of Japanese swordsmanship and I have joined said group to learn how to not be such a dumbass when I swing the sword around. You've seen me probably do uh, some reviews, and I make no claims to be a very good cutter. In fact, it's probably painfully obvious to anyone that studies Japanese swordsmanship that my cutting ability is very lacking. So hopefully I will look like less of an asshat in the future as I go through and learn to cut under more guidance. And I did my first round of cutting in my Toyama Ryu group last week, and there are some funny stories to tell. One, I'm not very good at cutting, that shouldn't come as a surprise, but getting some uh, meaningful direction kind of firsthand was very useful to me, and I will practice and hopefully get better. But second, I had cut my hand last week while cleaning a sword, a uh, story for a different day, and I probably should have gotten some stitches since it's been about a week and it's still somewhat open, but uh, the wound was somewhat fresh when I went to go do my cutting. I had a band-aid on it and it had stopped bleeding, but uh, through the course of cutting, my wound reopened. And like a dum-dum, I was kind of bleeding all over my sword and somewhat on the floor. <laughs> and that's kind of embarrassing. It'd be more embarrassing, granted, if I cut myself while I was practicing, and that, that would maybe, you know, maybe I should return to the kitty table if I cut myself with my own sword. But nevertheless, uh, <laughs> it was... Uh, bleeding a little bit as I was doing my practice cutting. And uh, I have a lot to improve on. Toyama Ryu is really specific about the angles 
you know, your tatami mat should be cut at a 45 degree angle and they have measuring devices there to show if it's cut at a 45 degree angle or not. Your horizontal cut should be cut at a 40 or not a 45 degree angle, then it would be horizontal. They should be pretty flat and, you know, all, all of that type of stuff. So it's, it's good to get the instruction from folks that cut routinely every week and I'm finding a lot of value in, in attending the class and hopefully, as I mentioned before, I will look less shoddy when I go to test these swords and will well, hopefully the test cutting will be more meaningful to any prospective viewer as I will uh, have a little bit more experience in cutting them in a way that is good. <laughs> That's pretty much all I have for you on the sword, uh, sword log vlog vlog stuff. I have a lot of other videos to make. Hopefully I can make progress this weekend. I have some swords that I showed you in the last sword log vlog vlog or the last couple of them that I've received. Uh, a couple project blades that I really wasn't expecting getting, but I should make the first video in the series of projects uh, to show higher resolution photos and things like that. I'm super thrilled with the swords that I got, and I think they're going to make some pretty amazing pieces when they're finished, but it's going to take me probably a couple of years to get them all done. So I better get started on the videos so I can, uh, well, I suppose it doesn't matter if it's going to be a couple of years, but when people have the ability to actually work with them, I need to be ready to send them. So I should get the videos done sooner than later. That is all I have for you for this iteration of my Sword Log Vlog Vlog. Thank you for watching, I hope you have a good day, and cheers. <laughs>